Um, so first of all, Hannah, I'm interested. Could you, um, part of these, all of these talks at the OAC, they were sort of about Transnistria. Could you explain uh, the region's status, what right now, like why does it look the way it does, and what are the talks leading towards? What kind of resolution could we possibly see from these uh, developments? Yeah, definitely. This week, uh, the quite a historical negotiations took place in Berlin because for the last two years, we haven't had any negotiations, direct negotiations in the 5 plus 2 format. It is the main negotiation format for the Transnistrian conflict resolution. Uh, it's quite an interesting because it was only protocol signed. However, all sides expressed their opinion that it is very positive negotiations and that in July, when the next uh, round will take place, it will be informal negotiations on the confidence building. They will be able maybe even to sign uh, the documents on the main issues. Currently, uh, there were uh, four main issues uh, to discuss. First, it is the uh, disapproval or dissatisfaction of the Transnistrian side that several criminal cases have been um, initiated by Moldovan government a few years ago uh, against the governmental authorities of Transnistria. So it was quite a, a serious point uh, why the negotiations have not taken place within these two years. The next, uh, very technical on the first uh, side, but very important for two sides, it is so-called telecommunication issue. It is a question of the frequencies for the mobile operators of two countries, because sometimes they were just uh, stopping each other. And finally, they are very close to the decision. The uh, third issue, it is the approval of the diplomas of Transnistria. So to sides are talking in the working group about the possibility of Transnistrian diplomas to be recognized not only in Moldova but to be in the same standards as the Moldovan um, educational type, high educational diploma. And the last but not the least, it is the question of the uh, um, car plates, so the uh, possibility and recognition of the Transnistrian car plates in the territory of Moldova. So on the first side it is quite technical issues, but all four were very politicized by both sides, and if you multiply it on the uh, current political and economic crisis both in Moldova and Transnistria, you can imagine that for the last two years it has been very difficult to renew the negotiations. Thanks for that uh, detailed explanation, Hannah. I mean, how long away are we from a potential resolution? And I mean, what would that really look like? Would it, I mean, is, is it possible that Transnistrian independence could be widely recognized or are we looking at some sort of reintegration into Moldova? You know, that is something of the wishful thinking or even the uh, um, crystal ball uh, guessing because with the protracted conflicts you never can say that it is tomorrow. Uh, when you don't have fighting, both sides are not ready for the uh, very quick compromise because they have nothing to lose. Sure. And uh, these two sides are living in these conditions for the last 25 years, so the year plus the year minus, uh, it's nothing for them. Uh, definitely, uh, um, if you speak now, then independence is probably the least possible scenario because uh, Transnistria for several times within this 25 years has been announcing it, proclaiming it. However, even Russian Federation didn't recognize it. The last time it was two years ago after annexation of Crimea, Transnistria again tried these efforts to persuade Russian Federation to recognize its independence and Russia said, no, not now, not for you. So uh, they even separated this issue from Abkhazia and South Ossetia, who uh, have been recognized Wait immediately in 2008 after the Russian-Georgian war. So independence is not the option. Uh, the uh, United States uh, doesn't matter federation, confederation, any status. Uh, it's not so close because uh, now both sides are ready to speak only about technical issues, but not ready for so-called political negotiations. And when we say political negotiations, it means about the political status of Transnistria. So currently, we can expect that at, uh, till the end of the year, Germany, as the chair of the OSC for 2016, uh, definitely will push two sides to reach at least some agreements uh, some protocols, some decisions about those four issues that I named uh, before. So to have at least some step forward. And it was uh, the statement of the German side after the negotiations in Berlin that we really hope that at least some practical sides will be done to change the um, to, to change the pattern that we see now. Because like two years, no negotiations, now we start. So we need to uh, seal them with some protocol or with some decision. 
Sure, Hannah. And before we one last question, I just sort of want to call the audience's attention to the plasma we have up. Uh, it's a four things you should know about Moldova's anti-oligarch uprising, um, and it gives some interesting background on the situation that we saw there this past winter with protests. But the question I have for you is uh, slightly different. I mean, people have seen Transnistria, Transnistria as sort of a model for Russia's operations in the Donbass as a, you know, not, not really a parallel so much as a foreshadowing. Uh, I'd be interested if you could talk a little bit about, you know, in what ways are they similar, but also in what ways are they different? Um, there is definitely only one similarity that it is completely political, nothing ethnic in this uh, conflict. And uh, the second similarity, it is the um, manipulation of this Russian speaking or um, necessity to protect the uh, uh, pro-Russian elements uh, in uh, two regions. It was quite the same. Uh, probably yet one, it is the... Uh, um, so I, I can name it similarity that 25 years ago we also saw a lot of um, uh, fake news and a lot of uh, information warfare and gossip spreading that um, changed the situation. So in this it is definitely the same. What is completely different, uh, first of all, that Transnistria definitely doesn't have any borders with Russia. So it is much more difficult for them and for the Russian Federation to support Transnistria. There are limitations, just geographic limitations. The second issue is that luckily in um, Donbass in the very beginning we didn't have the Russian army. In Transnistria one of the issues that still uh, is very topical that uh, Russian Federation has the military base and uh, um, even when the peacekeepers were deployed at this territory Russian Federation didn't want to withdraw them saying that they are necessary to protect the storages of their ammunition or uh, there were many many reasons stated after this. The first was the protection of the ammunition. Sure. So uh, in our case, in, uh, if the border between Ukraine and Russia um, closed and uh, other uh, measures of the Minsk um, process uh, would be implemented, uh, there should be much easier for the uh, um, stopover effect. However, in Transnistria, uh, till the moment when you still have the Russian army and the Russian military at their territory, it always will be a possibility to trigger the conflict on the ground but also for people to feel the fear. You right. know, that is the most important, that despite there is no fighting, despite there are no killings, wounded, explosions, any uh, symbols of the war. The fear is still exists, the right? The big fear. Right. Uh, because army is there, so it means that the danger and the threat exist. So we need protection. If we need protection, who can it be? Definitely Russians, because we think that Russians are friends. So there is something like a circle, you know, psychological circle in which these people are trapped for the last um, decades. And it is much more difficult to stop it uh, comparing to the new conflicts, because their people are still fresh in their memories about the uh, um, fear and uh, both sides.